<laughs> Natural disasters in China continue as typhoons threaten eastern China. Concerns are growing around food shortages in China as a recent video of rotting corn storage has gone viral. Also, we have an interview with retired Brigadier General Robert Spaulding on China's unconventional war against the United States. Welcome back, everyone. First off, the natural disasters are continuing in China. These include recent typhoons and some bizarre natural phenomena, which we'll be explaining the significance of. Now, areas in eastern China were evacuated over typhoon warnings, and it could impact parts of Zhejiang, Fujian, Shanghai, and elsewhere. Now, Chinese state media reports that the CCP's Ministry of Emergency Management warned of heavy rains in parts of southern China from August 1st to August 6th. And the double typhoons that are now hitting China could make the existing floods still worse. Now, the stronger of the two of these typhoons is expected to also move north and to make landfall on the night of August 3rd, so tonight, essentially. Meanwhile, Chinese netizens believe a phenomenon of summer snow has symbolic meaning. As the CCP virus epidemic continues to spread in addition to floods throughout China and in addition to other disasters, few parts of China are being left out basically. And recently, there's been a strange phenomena seen in Beijing, Shanghai, Qinghai, and in other places of snow, despite the summer heat. Now, China's netizens have commented that the snow in June is a sign of great grievance or injustice. I'll be explaining the story on this. On August 1st, Sina and Qinghai News in China reported, quote, rare snowfall in Qinghai dog days of summer. Now, dog days means the hottest days in summer of the Chinese calendar. Now, Qinghai's official department noticed this anomaly that happened from July 30 to July 31st, and many noted the extreme rare experience of these severe snowfalls taking place during these hot, again, dog days of summer. Now, according to the report, it began to rain in Qingsuihe town at 8 o'clock in the evening on the 30th. Now, after nightfall, the rain was strong, which caused the local temperature to continue to drop. Then there was a weather phenomena of rain mixed with snow until around 8 o'clock in the morning on the 31st. It turned into snowfall, with precipitation reaching close to 0.8 inches and snow depth reaching around 0.4 inches during this whole process. Now, videos show that local people had to turn on their windshield wipers while driving. Now, traditionally in China, this has deep symbolic meaning. Now, snow in June is a sign of injustice having happened. It was believed to suggest that even heaven knows the injustice and is showing its grievance through snowfall. Now, this ties to the popular Chinese play from around 1300 AD on the injustice of Duo E, known as Snow in Midsummer. Now, it tells the story of a child bride turned widow who was wrongly convicted of crimes by corrupt officials and was executed. After her death, several phenomena followed, including blood raining from the sky, a three-year drought, and snow in June. Hence the symbolic significance of the current summer snow in China. And China currently has no shortages of injustice. Now, among these, the wife of China's human rights lawyer Gao Jisheng recently called for attention from the international community for his disappearance of nearly three years. Now, his wife, Gung He, fled China to the United States back in 2009 with their children. In an interview with the Epoch Times, Gung He said that on August 13th, Gao Jisheng will have been missing for three years and whether he's alive or dead is still unknown. She hopes that European political figures and the international community will pay attention to the case of Gao Jisheng. Now, Gung Ha said that the CCP virus has affected the world. Through this epidemic, the world has become more aware of the CCP's nature. She said, quote, It is extremely difficult for political leaders and countries around the world, the international community, to recognize the evil of the CCP. And she continued stating, quote, The speech of the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo touched me a lot. The whole world has recognized the epidemic, especially the CCP. The United States is willing to work with the Chinese people to change China. Now, in other news, a recent finding with stores of Chinese corn is deepening concerns about a possible food crisis in China. In early July, a video revealing corn quality issues in Dong Depot, which is a direct deposit warehouse branch of China Grain Reserves Corp, has been circulating online. Now, the corn being stored there can be crushed between two fingers into powder. There's a thick layer of dust and impurities on them. The management of the grain depot also admitted this, stating, quote, the country keeps this game 
what can you do about it? Now, on August 2nd, pictures showed a notice from another direct branch of this company stating it is, quote, prohibiting people from bringing cell phones and other video recording equipment into the depot. Chinese netizens have questioned whether authorities are, quote, disappearing footages and instead of resolving the actual problem, trying to resolve the, quote, problematic people. Now, the notice also stated that, quote, customers who purchase grain are restricted to one person in the warehouse. Customers who purchase grain must put their mobile phones in the storage cabinet designated by the guard. In other words, it appears they're banning recording equipment from entering this warehouse. Now, after the inspection, China Grain Reserves Corp declared there was no issue with the quality of the grain in this area, but declared instead there was a problem of people at the warehouse charging people additional fees. And it declared on July 19th that the, quote, relevant personnel were fired by the company. This is, of course, being seen as a cover-up. Now, on July 31st, Zhao Zhengyang, the former deputy chairman of the Internal and Judicial Committee of the 12th National People's Congress, and also the former secretary of the Shanxi Provincial Party Committee of the CCP, was sentenced to death for taking bribes. Now, he was given a two-year reprieve and is deprived of political rights for life. All of his personal property has been confiscated, and he's also being given a possibility that his sentence could be reduced to life in prison without parole. He did not appeal the judgment. Now, among Zhao Jingyang's many crimes was his role in brutally persecuting Falun Gong practitioners during his nearly 15-year tenure in Shanxi. He was also closely tied to the Jiang faction of the CCP, which is led by former CCP leader Jiang Zemin, who initiated the persecution of Falun Gong and who also rose to power through the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Now, in project contracting, business management, job promotion, job transfers, and other methods, Zhao and the Jiang faction he belonged to received bribes equivalent to around 717 million renminbi. Now, corruption is known to have taken place throughout his family as well. After he was arrested, his wife, brother, daughter, and many immediate family members were also taken away for investigations. A report from China's Kaishin.com disclosed that the Zhao Zhengyang family had, quote, white gloves in all of the major and key industries such as oil, gas, coal, and real estate in Shanxi. And now for the broader stories for today. First off, the Chinese regime is increasing its military posturing and internal propaganda as pressure grows against the CCP. Now, this included sending bombers for attack exercises in the South China Sea and adding turbo generators to its warships, allegedly for weapon systems, including lasers and rail guns. Now, in Tibet, where the CCP has been moving forces amid growing border disputes with India, and where the regime is also working to wipe out the Tibetan culture, the People's Liberation Army ground force released propaganda footage showing maneuvers of newly delivered heavy-duty military trucks. Now, IHS Jane's reports, quote, The footage shows several of the new trucks, the designation of which was not disclosed, taking part in a number of driving drills, including one simulating an engagement by enemy personnel. Now, these, in addition to other troop movements and developments, hints that something deeper may be taking place. Washington Times national security correspondent and author Bill Gertz wrote on Twitter, quote, Something is up in China. Civil defense posters and drills are being held amid growing tensions with U.S. Internally, sources suggest a power struggle is underway within CCP, pitting Xi Jinping against Shanghai faction rivals. So what are we seeing here? Now, as we mentioned before, it's highly unlikely the Chinese Communist Party could win a direct war right now. So, for example, it has border disputes with India right now, very tense disputes. With Taiwan, they have border disputes. With Vietnam, they have border disputes. With Japan, they have border disputes. With Philippines, they have border disputes. The Chinese Communist Party has many, many different, say, small conflicts like these. If a war or conflict were to break out in any one of these areas, not only would China risk, for example, other areas moving forward on their border disputes to take advantage of the situation, but would even risk them uniting against the CCP. And this is barring even the possibility of the United States joining in. There are different defense analysts who suggest the Chinese Communist Party would very unlikely be able to win a war even against just Taiwan. And at the same time, the CCP itself appears to be unstable. There are many signs of internal fighting within its own ranks. There are many factions within the Chinese Communist Party, the two ones again being that under Xi Jinping, the head of the Communist Party right now, and Jiang Zemin, who was two leaders ago. 
Now, the Jiang faction is also pretty bad itself, arguably even worse than the Xi faction, and they've been at each other's throats for quite a while now. And this is not to mention other smaller factions throughout the country. Now, you also have different, say, local officials even breaking ranks with higher officials, and Xi Jinping appears to be aware of the situation. Now, Bill Gertz, as we mentioned here, appears to be mentioned this as well, that there are different disputes taking place within the ranks of the Chinese Communist Party itself. And when the CCP and Xi Jinping himself start coming out and talking about political security, this is the context that they're discussing. And on this note, as the Chinese Communist Party is facing this increasing pressure, it's also showing signs of fear. South China Morning Post reported that CCP leader Xi Jinping is bracing for, quote, turbulence ahead as its relations with the United States break down. On July 27th, the Chinese Communist Party's Minister of Public Security delivered a speech emphasizing the regime's need for social control. Now, Zhao, the individual in charge of it, stated, quote, in the face of profoundly changing external environment and severe and complex situations, public security organs at all levels must resolutely implement the decisions and deployment of the Chinese Communist Party's Central Committee with comrade Xi Jinping at the core. And while discussing the perceived threats to the CCP, Zhao gave orders, quote, strictly to guard against and crack down on the disruptive sabotage activities of hostile forces at home and abroad, carry out anti-infiltration, anti-subversion, anti-separatism, and anti-evil religion struggles, and resolutely safeguard nationals' public security. Now, in addition to this, China's ambassador to the UK is trying to push back against the increasing focus on the CCP's human rights abuses coming from other countries. So what does this all mean? Now, the Chinese Communist Party, again, is facing many different types of pressure. Let's explain some of these now. They have diplomatic pressure. For example, the U.S. closing the Chinese consulate in Houston and the CCP responding by closing the U.S. consulate in Chengdu. Now, the Trump administration is allegedly moving forward with another plan on this to limit the CCP's number of diplomats allowed in the United States to the same number of U.S. diplomats being allowed in China. Also, with negotiations, with debates, different countries in the world are no longer afraid of hitting these soft spots of the Chinese Communist Party, one of the main ones being its human rights abuses. Now, when it comes to pressure for economic theft, for example, and spies, or for example, even the One Belt, One Road initiative, all of this has direct implications not only for the CCP's image, but also for its economy. The Chinese Communist Party has been exploiting just about every single point it possibly can, whether it's stealing economic, say, secrets from the United States, trade secrets, and so on, or whether it's, for example, doing things through the One Belt, One Road initiative to get countries into debt traps. Different countries are not only becoming more aware of this, but they're beginning to push back against it. And when the CCP's economy, all their numbers, all their data, is based on the systems that they've been exploiting, what happens when all those systems are suddenly removed? Also, in addition to this, there is pressure on the perception of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, for many years, going back at least to Deng Xiaoping, a few leaders back, the individual who did the reforms in opening up the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP has been using a program of soft power. They want to have a friendly veneer with dealing with other countries. The CCP has lost that friendly veneer now. And many countries are beginning to see the CCP for what it is, a regime that persecutes its own people to a brutal, brutal extent, and that is hostile to many countries. Now, when it comes to these statements from the Minister of Public Security, Zhao, again, he's talking about many, many different fronts the CCP needs to be focused on. Whether they can deal with all these individually is actually questionable. But let's go over some of them now. Zhao warned about, quote, separatism. What is separatism in the CCP's language? Well, that refers to things like Hong Kong democracy, Taiwanese independence, to say freedom in Tibet, to independence in Xinjiang where they're persecuting the Muslim Uyghurs. It includes all these different areas the Chinese Communist Party claims ownership over and where many different groups in these areas claim otherwise. When the CCP talks about fighting against separatism, it means using suppressive measures in these different regions, such as in Hong Kong. Now, even Hong Kong alone is a major thorn in the CCP's side right now, where you've had at least 2 million people go on the streets and protest 
against the influences of the Chinese Communist Party. Taiwan, for example, is pushing back hard against the CCP. Xinjiang has become a focus of international attention when it comes to the CCP's abuses of human rights there. And whether the CCP is going to be called up for its other abuses, such as in Tibet or in parts of Mongolia, we'll have to see as well. Now, when Zhao talked about orders on the, quote, anti-evil religion struggles, Zhao is talking about the CCP's different suppression of religions in China. This includes Muslim Uyghurs. It includes House Christians. It includes Catholics. It includes Falun Gong practitioners. It includes Tibetans. The CCP calls any religion it does not directly control as being an evil religion if it gains even moderate levels of support. And so when they talk about anti-evil religion struggles, orders on this, the CCP is talking about extending its programs for persecuting religious believers in China. And when Zhao made statements to, quote, resolutely safeguard national political security, what's he talking about here? Political security means the infighting with the CCP itself. It means the factional battles. And so what he's talking about is possibly political purges, arresting different officials, going after different factions as they fight against the Xi faction, for example. They're talking about internal struggles within the Chinese Communist Party itself. And so what are we seeing here? This isn't even covering all of it, by the way. But what we're seeing here is that the overall picture demonstrates the Chinese Communist Party is unraveling. It has many, many conflicts, whether it's abuses of its own people, whether it's the natural disasters the country is facing, whether it's the virus outbreaks, whether it's potential food shortages and pushback they're receiving from the Chinese people on all of these issues, whether it's local officials no longer listening to higher level officials, whether it's infighting within the party itself, whether it's these different border disputes in regions challenging the CCP or different regions the CCP claims ownership over, having backlash from those regions against the CCP as well, and whether it's international pressure against the Chinese Communist Party, or whether it's economy, for example, whether it's ideology. Every single front, they're facing a major battle. And any one of these individually would be a big deal for the Chinese Communist Party. And as the CCP grows increasingly hostile towards other countries, its actions are driving other nations to unify against it. Now, in a recent speech, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called on the free world to unite against the tyranny of the Chinese Communist Party. We, the freedom-loving nations of the world, must induce China to change, just as President Nixon wanted. We must induce China to change in more creative and assertive ways because Beijing's actions threaten our people and our prosperity, securing our freedoms. From the Chinese Communist Party is the mission of our time, and America is perfectly positioned to lead it because our founding principles give us that opportunity. And public reporting is now beginning to state that the U.S. policy on China appears to be bringing an end to the Communist Party itself. Now, the United States has formed a quad alliance with Japan, Australia, and India to stand up against the CCP in the Asia-Pacific, and now the European Union is also showing signs of unifying against the CCP. The diplomat reports that, quote, the EU has no choice but to be united with regard to its interactions with China as Beijing's foreign policy becomes more centralized and assertive. Now, as the Chinese Communist Party is putting additional pressure on different countries within Europe, they're now talking about unifying as well, very similar to this new Quad Alliance being formed again with the United States, Australia, India, and Japan. The EU is talking about unifying when it comes to facing pressure from the Chinese Communist Party. Because the Chinese Communist Party, when it comes to dealing with countries like Europe, what they want to do is balkanize them. They want to focus on each individual country individually when it comes to diplomacy and pressure. And Europe is now talking about unifying in its response to China, not allowing them to do that. Now, in addition to this, just a few examples. Vietnam has already taken a strong stance against the regime. Myanmar is showing signs of breaking from the CCP for providing weapons to its militants in the country. And even Malaysia, one of their allies, is also joining in to rebuke the CCP. And this is something we're seeing in other areas as well. With Russia, for example, after it halted the sale of the S-400 missile defense systems to China, it again stopped the sale of these systems. It began speeding up the sale of these same missile systems to India during a time when China has having this conflict with India. And now Russia is in discussion with the United States to reduce tensions between the two countries when it comes to their space programs. 
And on top of this, again back to India, India is moving a force that comes close to matching that of the CCP's in its border disputes. It announced it will move 35,000 additional troops to the India-China border in the Himalayas. And so again, what are we seeing here? The Chinese Communist Party is facing pressure from its own people, from countries around the world, and from individual factions within its own ranks. Its strategy that to respond to all of this has been to double down, to become more hostile and more aggressive. And all signs are suggesting that this strategy is having the opposite effect. So in other words, its programs on this are backfiring, and its strategy on this is failing. Now, we've been seeing a lot of news about the Chinese Communist Party's programs for espionage, its different aggressions, and the broader context of how this fits in with its systems of unconventional warfare. To learn more about this, we've invited retired Air Force Brigadier General Robert Spaulding to speak with us. Now, Spaulding is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and author of Stealth War, How China Took Over While America's Elite Slept. He's also a former China strategist for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Joint Staff at the Pentagon, as well as a senior defense official and defense attache to China. So, General Spaulding, it's a real pleasure having you back on Crossroads. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, we've recently seen several professors and researchers being charged for their involvement in Chinese espionage, and the Department of Education is now heavily investigating CCP espionage in American universities. Now, when it comes to the CCP targeting our universities, how big of an issue is this? Well, it's a big issue, and I think it, it just goes to um, the central threat of the Chinese Communist Party, and that is not an invasion, you know, from the sky or from the sea uh, or from the land. It's really about undermining our society from within. So, you know, it's, it's an invasion of the mind, and the first place that you go if you want to change people's minds is to the university system. So it is, it is kind of the, you know, the front lines of, of the battlefield that they choose to operate on. Now, what are some of the different uses the CCP gets from subverting our universities? Well, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that they're trying to do is create space for their narrative to, to blossom. They want to create an opportunity to have a dialogue that, you know, is oriented to the perspectives that these students are gaining in these universities. And they want to be able to have their narrative be plug and play into the system that they've already kind of adopted as students in the university system. So they want to be in there, they want to be part of the, uh, part of the discussion, and they want, to, they want to mold the minds to be able to accept future messages. Now, the Chinese Communist Party has a military branch dedicated to political warfare, which is the liaison office of the General Political Department. We've seen several cases now of the CCP financing news outlets and think tanks in the United States. Now, would it be accurate to say this ties to the CCP's programs for political warfare? And how do you see the CCP waging political warfare? Well, I think the, um, all the traditional ways apply um, of politics in terms of what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. But I think the, the interesting thing that they bring that's really a modern twist on Mao's people's war strategy is really the fact that they can leverage data. You know, the connectivity that comes with the global internet and globalization, the connection between social media and e-commerce and, and regular media. There's a, you know, there's a lot of people that talk about, you know, cross-platform, promotion of, of, of ideas. And that's essentially the, the, the environment that was purpose made for a regime like the Chinese Communist Party that sees control of the narrative, understanding, you know, and creating understanding of what they want to do in a way that promotes their interest is the really the high point of the way they look at warfare. And so Amazon and Google and Facebook have petabytes of data that they can use algorithms on to slowly uh, enculturate and influence their members. This is a tool that the Chinese Communist Party basically has adopted wholesale. And really the reason they created the Great Firewall, it gives them the bastion for, uh, behind which they can essentially indoctrinate their own population. But at the same time, they can deploy these apps, services, and business models abroad to not only you know, make money for companies like Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, but use those same companies 
to um, create a fertile, uh, you know, environment for their ideology to spread. Yeah, the Chinese regime is getting more aggressive in its territorial claims, including in its border conflicts with India and in the South China Sea. We're seeing now, however, that many countries are taking a stronger stance against it. What do you think the trajectory of this is? Well, I think that's going to continue. I think it's a part of the nature of the regime. I think it's specifically tied to Xi Jinping, who sees territorial issues as his legacy. We're going to have to continue to uh, essentially push back against it. Coercion and bullying in the international space is something that we've been dealing with for a long time. And I think, you know, we need, needed to continue to work with allies and partners to prevent. But ultimately, I don't think it's going to lead to further, you know, heightened conflict. And that's because of the presence of nuclear weapons in the equation. So I think you're going to see that as a feature going forward. I think the United States needs to work to prevent that and ameliorate that. But at the same time, the real focus of what the Chinese are trying to do is really in the ideological, the political, the internet space that really drives so much of our society in, in, in politics today. Hey, General Spaulding, thanks again for being on Crossroads. Thank you. Now, we'll be showing the extended version of this interview on Patreon for our supporters there, and we'll be going more in-depth into China's unrestricted war, so please join us there. Now, with that said, folks, again, we're broadcasting Monday through Friday, five days a week. And also, if you want to support us, please join us on Patreon. The link is in the description below. And also, if you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Again, it really helps this channel grow. If you want to go the extra mile, please tell a friend or family member about Crossroads. Now, with that said, folks, please take care of yourselves, stay healthy, and stay free. Mm -hmm.